Hello, my delicious co-creators. Lilu here. I'm in beautiful, sunny Switzerland near Geneva. We have the mountains around the lake. This is absolutely delicious to be sitting next to you, Pierre. We have the birds too and the flowers. Oh my God. In a garden, a wonderful garden, yes. Yes. I feel very spoiled too and I feel very privileged to be doing this mm. interview with you, Lilu. Really, we... We're so much on the same wavelength. Uh, I love it because it's one of those recommendations through the site and uh, and people were really excited that we we meet, you know, and, and I saw your books and all your work and I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is really what my life is about, you know, to meet people like you and then spread that, share that on the internet and thank God for the internet so that anybody around the world right now have access to free internet can see it. Yeah, the internet is really an amazing blessing. I was saying in another interview that I think in a few tens of years and maybe hundreds of years, when historians look over our period, there'll be the before and after internet period in world history. Mm. Because it has really shifted world history and is doing so because it enables the communication of ideas. Uh, now, I know there's a lot of junk on the internet, but there's also a lot of wonderful, wonderful stuff. And it is proving to be an instrument for the raising of human consciousness at a growing speed. And that is so important. Mm. And this is one of those conversations that raises consciousness. I love your way of seeing life and seeing life differently. And the, one of your books, out of uh, all the 15 books I think that you wrote, you know, the art of the gentle art of blessing, I think is really one that I would love to share with all co-creators out there in the world that we can practice and start shifting our life. How did this came about and what is this, this art of blessing? Tell us everything. We want to practice it daily and bring this love to a new level. <laughs> I'd love to share this because it's been one of the most powerful experiences in my life. By the way, the book, The Gentle Art of Blessing, is published by Simon and Schus Schuster. Mm. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, work. I'm very grateful. They, they, the, the, the cover is, I think, the, of all the covers of all the books I've ever published, it's my favorite cover. And the content, of course, is also <laughs> quite substantial. And now the book exists now in in eight languages, including Danish, Slovene, and quite, some quite out of the ordinary languages. And it happened in the following manner. I was working in Lausanne for a group of Swiss NGOs active in the field of international development. In other words, they were working in third world countries. And I was asked to start a new program for schools. For, that was in the 80s, so it was 30 years ago, educating teachers and children on the realities of the world today, of North-South relations, and similar issues. And I threw myself into my work totally, and I mean absolutely unreservedly. I even had a camp bed at the office, and when I missed the last train home at night, I'd often sleep at the office. And at one moment, I wanted to do a roving exhibit on world hunger, because it is one of the world's main problems. Today, little 900 million people would go to bed hungry. 900 million. So it's one of the world's major social and human problems. Mm. And there was no money in the budget. So I invested what today would be the equivalent of at least... And I, stress at least $25,000 out of my own pocket, out of my own economies, mm. to organize this exhibit, which worked very well. It was spoken up of in the press and very well accepted, and my employers were absolutely delighted. And at the same time, I joined a world campaign against hunger called The Hunger Project, which came from the United States. And my employers did not like this campaign at all. I don't know for what reasons. They never told me. And there's one person... There's Lynn Twist huh, that is very involved. Actually, I had the chance to, to meet her. Yes, she's a lovely person. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, they never told me why they... Yeah. Especially one person in this, in this group of four organization who's a very powerful man. And he detested me personally. I think because... Uh, 
he, he felt a slight a spiritual dimension in me and he was a hard, hard atheist. And he... But you were not even provoking him, you were just being oh, you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he convened a meeting of the four organizations and he, by the way, opened the meeting by saying, I am an atheist which had strictly nothing to do with what we were meeting for and the meeting was without any notes, how do you say that procès verbal in English, uh, without any notes being taken, so it was completely legal. And um, they told me, look, either you stop speaking. No, no, I, I, they told me before to stop speaking of the hunger project in schools because they just didn't like it. Mm -hmm. I never understood why, but I obeyed. But I continued using the slogan of the hunger project, the end of the hunger by the year 2000, because... I've lived 11 years in Africa, I worked closely with peasant farmer organizations and one of the organizations in Senegal with which I had constant contact had the same slogan, the end of hunger by the year 2000. So I thought, well, if this slogan is good for the peasant farmers of Senegal, I can use it in my work. Yeah, it's like it's something universal that doesn't nobody really owns. It's, 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 a, it's a vision uh, beyond religion, beyond institutions. Exactly, you've said it so well. Well, in case, so they convened the meeting and this guy opened by the meeting by saying, we don't like the hunger project, so either you stop saying we can end hunger by the year 2000 or you quit your job. Now, these are people whose organizations were working to end hunger. I mean, it was so insane, literally insane. And I took two, three days to think, and I realized I can't commit a moral harakiri, a moral suicide, by accepting this totally unreasonable uh, demand. So I quit my job. And I started developing a resentment that was just eating me up. You know, resentment is like a, a rat eating your entrails. It's just, it's there. And it, from morning the time, to yeah, night, yeah. it became an obsession. Under the shower, going to the post office, washing up, whatever. I was thinking of this the whole time. And I was doing all sorts of spiritual exercise, reading sacred texts, repeating my mantras, and all the, all the things you should do. Nothing happened. This resentment just persisted, persisted. And one day, reading the Sermon on the Mount, suddenly the words of Jesus, bless those who curse you. <gasps> just as if they were written in, in golden letters. Mm. Well, of course that's solution. Well, of course that's reply. And on the spot, I started blessing them. Blessing them in their health, in their finances, in their family life, in their contacts, in their joy, in every conceivable way. And by blessing I mean sending focused love to someone. That's how I define. Uh, so, so, so tell us more, like, so, so it's, it's directly from the heart to the heart with no analyse, analysis? It's not liturgical stuff. It's not thinking, I'm speaking, I'm blessing you in the name of God. No, you just bless them from the heart. And I was doing this morning and night. First, it was in the head because it was to obey what I thought was a revealed command. <coughs> but very, yeah. very soon, it went down to the heart because blessing is 100% heart energy. And I was doing this all day long. And suddenly, I started doing it in the street at the supermarket, at the post office. I took the train quite often and I would travel the whole walk, the whole length of the train, both ways, to be sure to not miss one person, blessing them all. I love that. And it became such a joy for yeah. me, an incredible joy. Yeah. And I'd been asked to give a talk in Zurich on the theme, Healing the World, for an international youth meeting. This was in 87. And I was preparing my talk, and suddenly I received a gust of inspiration. I felt literally like a scribe under orders. I was taking down words that were pouring into my mind. And it just filled up one page, and it was this text, The Gentle Art of Blessing. And I started sharing it in my correspondence, including with wonderful people like Dr. Gerald Jampolsky, the well-known author of Love 
is letting go of fear. I think he can be considered one of the fathers of personal development in the United States, a man of such radiant love who inspired me a great deal in the creation of my own workshops. And he had worldwide networks and he started sharing this text in his correspondence. And little by little, over the coming weeks and months, I started receiving responses from people everywhere saying it works, it works, it works. And I myself started having the most lovely experiences. Uh, for so just to, to make sure I understood, this was a text you wrote and then you sent kind of for free all over the internet, I mean through well, email. It was before, it was before internet. But it went viral, as we say now, yes. that so, so people yes. were sharing it. Exactly. And, then you, and then the publisher came, Simon Schuster. No, no, no that's la much later. Okay. It was first published, a very small edition, by a, a small California publisher, and then uh, he sold his rights to, to Simon and, and Schuster. As, uh, by the way, wrote it both in French and English. I didn't translate it, I wrote it again in English. And uh, so Pierre is bilingual, of course. We actually have this uh, another interview, a different kind, but in, uh, for that Télé de Lilou, which is the French version of this, of this web TV. It's just fascinating, different conversation. I love, yeah. I love having this conversation now in English, but anyway. And uh, so uh, I started uh, sharing and having wonderful experiences myself. Uh, I told about this peasant organization in Senegal which had the slogan uh, End of Hunger by the year 2000 and the leader of this organization was staying at my home and uh, I was taking him to the station carrying his two heavy suitcases and we crossed in the street a, m a young man I'd already crossed two weeks before and I don't think I've ever in my life seen such a look of despair, such haggard eyes, and such a just total despair. Mm -hmm. And I'd blessed him the first time I crossed him. And this time we, he, he was coming the other way on the pavement, we recrossed and I thought, this guy, this poor fellow must be completely drugged. And as we crossed, he hit me on the nose, punched me on the nose so violently, I fell on the pavement with my arms outstretched and the two uh, suitcases on the on the pavement and I jumped up and I told my friend who's called Demba, I said, Demba, bless him, bless him, bless him. That was my first reaction and he fell ran away, of course. And uh, wow. I continued to the station because we had a train to to, to take and continued blessing by the time about two minutes later we arrived on train uh, at the train uh, the the bleeding had completely stopped I felt there was a big a big swelling I went home I washed myself I didn't even look in the mirror and that evening when my wife came home she didn't notice anything at all as if nothing had happened another instance I was organizing with a, a Caribbean, uh, no, a Cameroonian friend, uh, a concert uh, with his orchestra. He had an Afro, Afro Caribbean orchestra. F the benef a benefit concert for these farmers in in Senegal, and we had a the hall of a big big college in Geneva, and the technician and and the handyman of the school had wanted to have nothing to do with our concert. It was at 8 in the evening, and the director of the school said, look, he's a civil servant, I can't force to work him to work after 5 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> so we had to get a technician from a, another school at a great expense. And the evening of the concert, which had been announced in the press on the radio, I arrived with my friend two hours before the, the concert, and there were only two mics left on the screen, on the, on the stage. And he said, look, I can't have ten singers and musicians and only two mics. We went to see the technician of the school, who was so hostile. I mean, he was behind a counter and I was with my friend opposite him. At first I felt great anger inside me. I thought, you know, he's not going to foul up our, our wonderful concert. And then a the little voice said, Pierre, you're not going to heal the situation with anger. Start blessing him. And mentally, while he was talking to my friend, I just started blessing him. Between two sentences, 
His face changed completely. A beautiful smile lit up his face. He went to his laboratory, came back with best mics, and wished us a wonderful evening. How do you explain what happens in those moments where it's truly miracles that are being uh, that are happening? Well, I think it's on the level of somewhere on the level of energy, the energy of blessing and love, which is the energy of blessing, is more powerful than any other kind of energy, and if you maintain it with su sufficient intention and conviction, it changes situations. But you don't do it to change the situation; you do it just to bless the other person. Another it's an unconditional act of love. It's a cosmic love that you like to use. That. I'll give you another example. Yeah. After I quit my job, as I explained a little while earlier, I decided to uh, realize an old dream I'd had of writing a positive book on Africa. Because you can count, at least in French, count on your fingers easily the, the entirely positive books on Africa published in the past 40 years. This was in 1987, and I decided I was going to travel through rural areas of Africa and write up the extraordinary thing mm. that the peasant farmers were doing to help themselves. Because everybody in the West has this, had this image of the, these, you know, these helpless Africans uh, who depend on our aid to, get, to, to further their well-being, which is ridiculous. So I set off early January on this 14,000 kilometer trip during which I talked in six countries to, to 1,300 farmers either individually or in groups and I traveled by every conceivable mode of locomotion except the hippopotamus and the camel and um, came home started writing my book. I had the conviction, if I write a good book, I will find a good publisher. I hadn't even contacted a publisher before leaving. And I financed the whole trip myself. And so I had nobody who was telling me what to write. And uh, just before finishing the manuscript, I met this young French woman at a meeting. And we became instant friends. And she'd published quite a few books in France already. And she told me, look, as soon as you finish your manuscript, send it to me. And I'll contact a, a friend in a good publishing house and we'll see what can be done. And so I wrote the, finished the book and uh, s phoned her and said, look, I'm going to send the, you the manuscript as we agreed. And by the way, I've taken an agent in Zurich, a literary agent, for a German and English um, version. The minute I mentioned literary agent, she exploded in the most foul language about mm -hmm. literary agents all over the world. Evidently, in her life, she must have had a, a very painful experience sometime. And she said, well, in case, as soon as have an agent, as so long as you have an agent, don't count on me. And she slammed the telephone. Well, it's in only because I did not want to keep this image of her in my mind. In the following days, when she came back to, to thought, I would just send her little blessings in her calm, in her peace, in her abundance, in her goodness, everything that came to mind. Ten days later, she phones me and she says, Pierre, you tell your agent to send the manuscript to Mr. So-and-so in such and such a publishing house and we will see what happened. Well, what happened was the book was picked up by one of the best and oldest French publishers, Edition Plon, mm. uh, for immediate publication. And not only that, she was able to get me uh, a foreword, you say, a foreword by uh, Edgar Pisani, who uh, at the time was a very well-known French politician and the most pro-African politician in the whole of Europe. Mm. And the book appeared in six languages, including... Um, uh, English, it was published by Prager Publishers in New York in 89. The publisher no longer exists. And uh, there we are. And I could, for hours, I could tell you story after story after story of the power of blessing. So it's like by blessing others, you don't do it for yourself, but there's huge gifts also that come along the way. Huh? Yes, you don't do it with the idea of changing something. You just do it because 
you want to correct your own picture of something being not working in your life and it happens as a result very often that it does change situations like if I can uh, tell you these stories by my friend from Mali he's a he's called Mamadou Kasambara he's a very very devout Muslim he also runs one of the most remarkable NGOs I know of in Africa and he's a very very dear friend and I called what's the name of the NGO uh, the, 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 the Promete, Prometheus, Prometheus, you know, the, 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 the fellow from the old legends. And uh, he, um, I sent him the text and he just took onto it. He gobbled it up, he made it his own practice. And he started, when he met people who had problems, he just tell them, look, you start blessing. This is how you do it. You just bless. And he met this... Uh, woman in the streets of Mopti, the little town where he lives, and she was the first wife of a man who'd just taken on a, a second wife, because in in the polygamous household, you know, you have different wives, and very often when the first wife gets starts getting elderly and a bit tired, around her 45, 50s, the husband often takes a much younger, sexier wife, and this has happened in this couple. And the husband was giving her hell. He was beating her. He was insulting her. And the young wife started insulting her too. And she was absolutely desperate. And she told, tells her whole story of woe to, to Mamadou, who says, look, you just start blessing. This is how you do it. You just bless her, bless him, and you'll see it will change the situation. And she went home that evening. And in Africa, people at the grassroots who are not Western educated have an extraordinary receptivity to new ideas. And she just caught onto this idea and that very evening just started blessing her husband, her co wife. The next morning, the husband came and apologized and stopped beating her and started treating her completely differently. The co-wife followed suit. She also stopped insulting her. And now the two women are given as examples mm. of harmony in a polygamous household. Mm. I find that so, so lovely. Yeah, yeah. And it's really universal examples beyond the, 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 the religion, beyond the labels, yeah. beyond all of that. And It's a practice that a person of any creed or color can can apply can practice that's what i love about it. it's really universal and i even have a an atheist friend of mine who shared my book with other friends of hers and you can even uh, uh say so so when you have the person and you want to uh, uh, to bless the person you say the opposite you're saying of what what really looks what it looks like okay when you l let's say that i'm in the in the bus or the street car i love i love uh blessing people in public transport, I see someone who looks just totally depressed or sad, I bless them in joy, I bless them in their happiness, I bless them in their peace, the opposite of what the material senses present. If I saw, see a poor cripple hobbling along uh, with great difficulty, I bless him in his uprightness, his strength, his perfect health, always the opposite of what the material image presents. Does it start with blessing ourselves too? I mean, I guess we have to include ourselves there. Because well, you speak a lot of loving ourselves, so the, so the blessing portion is big. Well, the postscriptum of the text, the one-page text on gentle art of blessing, is about blessing yourself, saying, and above all, do not forget to bless that beautiful person you are. I think it is so important in our Western Judeo-Christian culture, I think 90% of the people, at least, have great difficulty really loving themselves. And yeah. that's one thing I encourage viewers of this program to spend a little moment each day just blessing your, yourself. Start in the morning. Take a few minutes 
And if you do nothing else, just bless yourself in your beauty, in your harmony, in your strength, in the qualities you would like to express. Thank you, Pierre. I think we can go on and on for many hours talking together and I look forward to spending more time with you and I'm sure the people watching and the beautiful co-creators around the world are already sharing this video while they're still listening, you know, because this is this is a blessing to have you and to be able to share this. This is definitely why I go around the world. I love your Malian f shirt from Mali too. Mali, yes, it's yeah. a traditional shirt from Mali. Uh, and uh, Africa has so many beautiful shirts of this kind and I thought it would be nice. Yes. I put it on purpose because I thought it would be nice yes. to yeah, appear like that to the viewers. Yes, and Africans are, are watching the show too and I look forward to coming to Africa. I'm going to start with North Africa, Morocco very soon in a few months but uh, there is definitely so many positive stories, beautiful inspiring stories coming from Africa. It's time to upgrade our thoughts about all human beings and what's really going on on this planet my delicious co-creators we love you we bless we bless you abundantly abundantly blessing you today big big kisses goodbye friends goodbye meet you one day That's wonderful oh. 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 Hello my delicious co-creators, Lilu here. I'm in beautiful sunny Switzerland near Geneva. We have the mountains around the lake. This is absolutely delicious to be sitting next to you, Pierre. We have the birds too and the flowers. Oh my God. In a garden, a wonderful garden, yes. yes. I feel very spoiled too and I feel very privileged to be doing this mm. interview with you, Lilu. Really, we we're so much on the same wavelength. I love it because it's one of those recommendations through the site and uh, and people were really excited that we we meet, you know, and, and I saw your books and all your work and I'm like, oh my God, this is... In eight languages, including Danish, Slovene and quite, some quite out of the ordinary languages. And it happened in the following manner. I was working in Lausanne for a group of Swiss NGOs active in the field of international development. In other words, they were working in third world countries. And uh, I was asked to start a new program for schools. For That was in the 80s, so it was 30 years ago, educating teachers and 
children on the realities of the world today of north-south relations and similar issues. And I threw myself into my work totally, and I mean absolutely unreservedly. I even had a camp bed at the office, and when I missed the last train home at night, I'd... Jesus Consciousness, I love your way of seeing life and seeing life differently, and the, one of your books, out of uh, all the 15 books I think that you wrote, you know, the art of, the gentle art of blessing, I think is really one that I would love to share with all co-creators out there in the world, that we can practice and start shifting our life. How did this came about and what is this, this art of blessing? Tell us everything. We want to practice it daily and bring this love to a new level. <laughs> I'd love to share this because it's been one of the most powerful experiences in my life. By the way, the book, The Gentle Art of Blessing, is published by Simon and Schus Schuster. Mm. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, work. I'm very grateful. They, they, the, the cover is... I think the, of all the covers of all the books I've ever published, it's my favorite cover. And the content, of course, is also <laughs> quite substantial. And now the book exists now in often sleep at the office. And at one moment, I wanted to do a roving exhibit on world hunger, because it is one of the world's main problems. Today, Lilu, 900 million people would go to bed hungry. 900 million. So it's one of the world's major social and human problems. Mm. And there was no money in the budget. So I invested what today would be the equivalent of at least, and I stress at least, $25,000 out of my own pocket, out of my own economies, mm. to organize this exhibit, which worked very well. It was spoken up of in the press and very well accepted and my employers were absolutely delighted and at the same time I joined a world campaign against hunger called the hunger project which came from the United States this is really what my life is about you know to meet people like you and then spread that share that on the internet and thank God for the internet so that anybody around the world right now have access to free internet can see it yeah, yeah the internet is really an amazing blessing I was saying in another interview that I think in a few tens of years and maybe hundreds of years when historians look over our period there'll be the before and after internet period in world history mm. because it has really shifted world history and is doing so because it enables the communication of ideas uh, now I know there's a lot of junk on internet but there's also a lot of wonderful wonderful stuff and it is proving to be an instrument for the raising of human consciousness at a growing speed. And that is so important. Mm. And this is one of those conversations that raises...